Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, make yourselves comfortable. Thank you so much for being here. We'll get started in just a couple of moments. We just want to give some folks time to get in the room, the virtual room. Feel free to say hello if you would like, introduce yourselves in the chat, and we'll get started shortly. All right. Good evening. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Nova, and I'm the uh, communications coordinator here at NAMI Metro Baltimore. Um, and today we are joined by Dr. Shu and Bishop Sewell, and they are going to be sharing some incredible information about the topic of substance use recovery. Um, and I don't want to take too much time away from them because they're going to be sharing some really important community stuff, um, stuff about local resources, how recovery works and all that jazz. So for anybody who is not familiar with NAMI Metro Baltimore, we are the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the Metro Baltimore chapter. So there's a chapter in every state, county, um, and we're just really a group of folks who are volunteers, peers, people who have personal lived experience with a loved one who's living with a mental health condition. And we're really just dedicated to supporting one another um, through education, awareness, and advocacy. So basically our mission is to serve the one in five, I think it's more like one in three now, people living with a mental health condition um, and through grassroots, grassroots peer-based advocacy, education and support. So we provide free support groups, um, presentations like this one and educational classes so that people can really just learn about what stuff is out there so that they or their loved one can get support. Obviously September is substance use recovery month as well as Suicide Recovery Awareness Month. Um, and we just thought it was really important to focus on substance use recovery because back in 2019, 25,000 Baltimoreans were estimated to be addicted to heroin or opioids. And since the start of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that number has only gone up significantly due to increased isolation, um, difficulty accessing um, medical treatment, care, therapy, um, and all the other things that kind of help people who are in long-term recovery um, stay in recovery. So without further ado, um, I am going to let Dr. Shu introduce himself and cover his slides. And then after that, we will turn it over to Bishop Sewell to share his story and some of the incredible work that he's done here in Baltimore to support people living with uh, substance use disorder. Thank you very much, Nova, and thank you everyone for, for joining us in this wonderful webinar. Um, I think this is probably uh, one of the first uh, webinars that we've done on substance use disorder, so I'm very pleased that I was invited to come and share um, my experience and uh, share with you some of the clinical modalities that we can use to treat and help support people who have substance use disorders and who are seeking treatment and who are in recovery. Um, so I work at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. I'm a faculty member. I've actually been at Hopkins since um, 1999. I did my residency and I've spent pretty much my whole career working in um, sub working with helping people with substance use disorders, co-occurring mental health disorders, and also um, medical disorders um, such as HIV and hepatitis C. Um, next slide, please. So um, just going through some statistics, um, substance use disorders in terms of the prevalence in the United States, it's estimated about 20 million people in the U.S. suffer from a substance use disorder. Um, and the vast majority are uh, patients who have alcohol use disorder. Second most common is cannabis use disorder and then opioid use disorder, stimulant and sedative use disorders are less common. Um, so as you can see, substance use disorders is pretty prevalent in this country. And it's nearly 50% of people know someone who has suffered or is currently suffering from a substance use disorder. So the um, substance use disorder, of course, doesn't just affect the patient themselves, but the, the family as well. Um, the good news is about 23 million Americans are in recovery. 
However, 10% um, of Americans with a substance use disorder received any type of specialty treatment. And I think a lot of this is the that a lot of patients and families don't know what types of treatments are available out there, and they don't know how to access that treatment. So part of my talk is to help you understand the options and resources that are available. And just looking at Baltimore itself, unfortunately, I was only able to find data that was uh, that's a couple years old or several years old, but um, alcohol use in the past months. So this is just use, not patients with a substance with an alcohol use disorder, um, is is pretty high. Um, this is just anybody who had a drink over the past month, um, about fifty six point nine percent, which tracks along with the United States as a whole, um, and then. Alcohol use disorder was about 8.5% of the population of Baltimore City, which is a bit higher than um, the state of Maryland of 6.9 and the US of 6.3%. And then just looking at the next slide at um, drug use in general. So this isn't just, this isn't looking at people who actually have a substance use disorder, but just general drug use. You can see that marijuana use is pretty high as well, um, 20% in Baltimore, which is higher than the uh, state percentage and the US percentage. Um, and then cocaine use is 2.9%, which is higher than the US um, percentage of 1.9%. And then heroin use is also higher than the uh, state and the country as a whole. Um, so you can see that substance use is pretty prevalent in uh, Baltimore in our area. And um, that's why, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure that you all know that is a problem. And as Nova said, that things have gotten worse over the pandemic with increased um, opioid overdoses and deaths due to untreated substance use, uh, substance use disorders too. Um, and then just talking about what is a substance use disorder. Um, so the simplest way to think about it is that a substance, substance use disorder is uncontrolled use of a substance despite harmful consequences. Um, so people with a substance use disorder generally have a lack of control over their use. Um, social problems that arise from use. Um, substance use in risky situations. And they can also develop physical dependence. I'm going to go over these categories on the next slide. So lack of control is when uh, the substance is taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than intended. A persistent desire or failed attempts to cut down or control use. Um, a lot of time is spent trying to get the substance or recovering from its effects. Um, having cravings or a strong urge to use a substance. Social problems include inability to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. Continued substance use despite um, knowing that it's causing or worsening social or relationship problems. Um, and then cutting back or giving up social work or recreational activities because of substance use. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, risky use is using the substance in physically dangerous or hazardous situations, um, such as repeatedly uh, driving under the influence, continuing to use even when knowing that the substance is causing or worsening physical or psychological problems, and then physical de dependence is when someone develops tolerance to the substance, so needing more and more of the substance in order to get the same effect. So a person who has an alcohol use disorder may start out drinking um, four or five beers at a time, but they'll progress over time to drinking 12 to 24 beers in order to get the same effect that they got before. And then withdrawal symptoms, which can be different from each substance for each substance. Um, and then we can also um, categorize the substance disorder as being mild if they have two to three symptoms, moderate if they have four to five symptoms. And if they have a six symptoms or greater, then that's when um, a person has a severe substance use disorder and where somebody is probably addicted uh, to, to a substance. Uh, next slide, please. And um, in terms of what, what contributes to somebody developing an addiction or substance use disorder, it's an interaction of uh, a person's biology or genes, the environment, the characteristics of the drug itself, 
um, which act on the brain mechanisms that lead to addiction. Um, so the most important risk factors are genetics, which account for about 40 to 60% of the risk. And then uh, the other thing that's important to remember is that about 90% of people with substance use disorders began using substances before the age of 18. So young people um, and adolescents are particularly at risk because their brain is developing and they're exposed to substances um, and alcohol before their brain is fully developed, then they'll be more likely to become addicted to a substance over time. And that kind of plays into the environment as well. So it's important, particularly important for us to care for and supervise our kids and children and younger people because things that can lead to um, exposure to substances at early age include having a chaotic home, um, peer influences, community attitudes, um, and uh, difficulty in school. Um, and the next slide, I'll talk about the brain mechanisms. So um, the interesting thing is, is what happens when somebody uses a substance. And um, so all drugs of abuse or which can be potentially, um, which potentially someone can get addicted to work on the reward center of the brain, also known as the mesolimbic um, system of the brain. So if you look at the diagram, there's two main um, areas. Um, there's the limbic area, which is to the right. And that sends pathways to the um, cerebral cortex, um, which is a blue area. So um, the limbic area is, you can think of that as the survival area of the brain. So the limbic, the limbic area is what, what um, causes individuals and all biological organisms to seek out things such as uh, food, sleep, sex, and shelter. So these are things that are essential for survival. Um, and, then, uh, and then that affects the cortical area, which affects um, judgment, um, impulse control, and decision-making. So if you think of it this way, if somebody, if you're hungry, for instance, and you eat food, then your limbic system will activate your cort cortical area to go out and seek food so that you can survive, so that you can provide proper nutrition to yourself. After you ingest the food, after you eat the food, it will send back signals to the uh, limbic area, to the dopamine pathway, which is kind of the feel good chemical of the brain. So that's why after you, when you're hungry and you eat, you're gonna feel this sense of pleasure and reward and a sense of uh, satisfaction after you finish eating and you're full. The problem with drugs and alcohol is that they can, they can increase dopamine many times greater than natural rewards such as food or sex. So essentially over time, what happens is this reward system is hijacked by the drug um, and then uh, seeking out the and using drugs become becomes a person's main motivation in life. So instead of seeking food, sex, shelter, um, other pleasurable activities such as exercise or listening to music, over time, the um, individual who is addicted to a drug only seeks out the drug and they have impaired decision making, judgment, and impulse control because the limbic area is so highly activated that, that it inhibits your cortex from making um, good decisions. And then the brain scans on the next slide um, show that on the left are um, the red areas are normal dopaminergic activity. So a normal uh, person who is not addicted to drugs has normal uh, dopamine activity. In the middle is somebody that's a chronic uh, methamphetamine user. So what happens is that over time, because dopamine is so activated by, by methamphetamine, dopamine gets depleted. And that's why a person doesn't get the natural high or natural sense of satisfaction from, from pursuing natural rewards and pleasurable activities. However, the good news is that over time, after 14 months of being abstinent from the drug, the brain does recover and gets back mm. to normal um, 
dopamine activity. So that's why I think it's important to think of addiction and severe substance use disorder as, as something that's similar to chronic illness. Um, a lot of times in media and in TV, we think what happens is a person goes into a 28-day recovery program and then they're cured, but that's not the case. Um, the uh, recovery program is usually only the start of a person's journey towards recovery, and they need sustained support, um, in some cases, medical attention and treatment over time, and, and sometimes for the rest of their life as well. And if you go to the next slide, if you compare drug addiction to other chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and asthma, you can see that the relapse rate is, is pretty high for all these chronic medical conditions, including addiction. Mm -hmm. But unlike, um, but I think we treat chronic medical conditions a little differently than we do addiction. So for instance, if somebody comes in the hospital repeatedly for diabetes because they didn't follow their diet or they weren't compliant with their medications, we don't tell them that they're cured after they're hospitalized and they get treated for their high blood sugar. We tell them that they need to follow up as an outpatient. They need to see a nutritionist for diet suggestions, and they need to monitor their blood glucose regularly and check in with a nurse about their blood sugars and adjust their medications over time. Well, it's the same thing with addiction. When somebody's hospitalized for, for detox, that doesn't mean that, they, that you can just send them out to the community and that they'll be cured. They need ongoing treatment um, with a counselor, in some cases met with medications. And if they have co-occurring medical and um, mental health conditions, those need to be addressed as well. And so going over the different clinical treatment options. Um, so on this slide, they're in the order of the most intensive to least intensive. So, and it doesn't mean that Everybody needs to do all of these, but a, a lot of the intensity of treatment is based on where a person is at with the severity of their addiction, and also whether they have other um, co-occurring medical or psychiatric conditions and the amount of and level of social support they have. So the most intensive treatment would be an acute inpatient hospitalization. Um, so these would be patients that I see who are admitted to one of the uh, Meyer inpatient psychiatric floors. They usually come into the emergency room um, needing a detox because they've been using large amounts of alcohol or opioids or benzodiazepines. And a lot of times they also come in off their uh, psychiatric uh, medications. So they need to be restarted and have their um, depression, their psychosis, or bipolar disorder stabilized. Um, so this is an acute inpatient medical or psychiatric hospitalization. The next level is inpatient residential programs. So these are the 28-day programs we hear about where patients go in um, to a place like Turk House and they, and they get, um, get intensive groups and counseling and um, they're also in a safe setting where they um, are less likely to be exposed to triggers and uh, cravings, which might cause them to relapse and use otherwise. Um, intensive outpatient program or partial hospital program is where patients get 9 to 20 hours of services a week. So in these uh, programs, the patient generally um, stays at home if they have a safe living environment or they stay in a halfway house or a recovery house and they go to the treatment program several hours a week to get counseling and group treatment. And then um, standard outpatient care is less than nine hours of services a week. So this is generally somebody who's doing better, who has more control over their substance use and they check in with their counselor and and once a week and go to groups um, two to three times a week. Um, and then there are different tr treatment modalities that are available is um, usually when somebody enters a, a substance abuse uh, or a substance use disorder rehab program, they get a thorough assessment. So this includes getting a good history about their medical psychiatric um, 
substance use um, history, as well as a psychosocial history, to get a sense of what kind of supports they have out there and what kind of things they need. Um, if they're going to be on medications, they usually get a physical exam as well. Um, detoxification, particularly for alcohol and benzodiazepines, because those withdrawal from those two substances can be life-threatening um, because of seizures and DTs. Um, and then uh, various types of counseling and therapy, such as individual counseling, group counseling, and family therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is focused on changing people's thoughts and behaviors to prevent relapse. Um, contingency management is, um, so that's something that's been studied a lot in research, but it's not done a lot in clinical treatment settings because it involves giving patients prizes, vouchers, or a cash reward for, um, <laughs> for not using. Um, so there's some question about the ethics behind that, but it has been shown to be very effective in, in research settings. And then other things that are help support a patient in recovery are mutual health groups and peer support services. So peer support are people that are in recovery themselves who help the, the newly recovering addict uh, find resources and support and help them with their appointments and uh, monitor their medication taking. And then medication-assisted treatment is also a very important part of treatment, particularly with opioids, where it's found to be very effective. So medications such as methadone or buprenorphine, which activate the opioid receptor, um, help a patient with opioid cravings and withdrawal symptoms. But if dose properly doesn't make them intoxicated or high, um, naltrexone is an opioid blocker. So it blocks the opioid receptors and um, it has also been shown to reduce cravings as well. And it also comes in a long acting injectable that a patient could get every 28 days called Vivitrol. And then for alcohol, there's several options as well. There's disulfiram or anabuse, which is a medication that makes a person ill if they drink on top of taking the medication. Um, naltrexone, um, even though it's an opioid blocker, it helps remove some of the pleasurable effects that people get from alcohol as well. Um, so it can help relieve uh, alcohol cravings. Um, and then a campersate is a medication that helps patients who have um, long-term difficulty from coming off alcohol. Because a lot of times when people stop using alcohol, they can get cravings and anxiety and the jitters and a campersate seems to help with that. Um, next slide, please. And then um, the treatment staff at programs are multidisciplinary. So in addition to psychiatrists and physicians, you have psychologists, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, counselors, and, and peers, because um, addiction treatment is holistic. So it doesn't, isn't just um, one size fits all in terms of treatment. Not only do you have to address the, the brain mechanisms, you have to address um, the family, social support, um, and helping the patient be in a safe and um, supportive environment um, where they feel protected. Um, and that's going into what recovery is, uh, what the definition of recovery is. So recovery is a process of a change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And the different dimensions of recovery include health, home, uh, purpose. So this is a person having a sense of purpose and community. Um, next slide, please. So health uh, means overcoming or managing one's diseases or symptoms and making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. So this means addressing um, co-occurring mental health conditions. Um, <clears throat> All right, please continue. Okay, so I was just talking about how uh, the different dimensions of recovery. So managing one's uh, diseases or symptoms and making informed healthy choices. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so home is having a safe and uh, stable and safe place to live. So many of the patients I see at Hopkins, um, they are homeless. And so what we do is we try to get them into a residential treatment program or a recovery house 
and or transitional housing where they can uh, attend outpatient uh, recovery treatment from a safe environment. Next slide. Um, purpose is conducting min meaningful daily activities, such as having a job, school, doing volunteer work, um, taking care of the family, uh, creative endeavors, such as art or music, and having the ability to do so with independence, income, and resources to participate in society. So in our um, outpatient programs, we often try to get patients connected to community resources, such as vocational training, um, volunteer work, um, classes, so that they can have a sense of purpose in life. Next slide. And then community is important, having relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. So one thing that's that's very important for patients in recovery is to ha have a sober support network um, as well. Um, so this is where mutual help meetings, such as 12-step meetings play a part, um, church and spiritual communities, um, having the support of friends and family. Um, next slide. So I know that probably there are a lot of fam family members that are on here who um, are supporting a loved one who has a substance use disorder. So I just wanted to give you some tips as well on how to support your loved one. Um, so some, some advice that I can give you is to help your loved one remember treatment appointments and take all their prescribed medications, be available, if your loved one wants you to attend their treatment appointments or family therapy, or, or just ask if you can be engaged in their treatment in any way possible. Help them find treatment resources and mutual help meetings. Be part of their sober support network. It's important to be supportive, but not enabling. So um, it's important for you not to support their drug use and to enable that and to, you know, I, here a lot of times that families will give money to their family mem members because their family members are suffering from withdrawal, but it's probably not a good idea to do that because that prevents the um, uh, person from seeking out treatment. Um, and also make sure that, she, that, that you emphasize uh, personal responsibility and appropriate behavior on the part of the loved one with a substance use disorder. Um, and above all, be loving patient and non-judgmental. Uh, practice self-care yourself um, because it can be exhausting um, having a family member who has a substance use disorder. It takes a toll on your own mental health. And then um, educate yourself about substance use disorders and addiction. And mutual help meetings are available as well for family members. So for family members of alcoholics, Al-Anon groups are available. And for um, substance use disorders, NAR-anon NAR groups are available as well. And then the next slide, I just put several um, specific treatment centers that, um, uh, these are treat just treatment centers and these are just suggestions. Um, the first one on the slide is Ashley, which is a residential program that also provides IOP and standard outpatient located in Haverty Grace. Um, Mountain Manor is also provides residential IOP outpatient and medication assisted treatment. Helping Up Mission is for those patients who want a more faith based residential treatment program um, where patients can stay up to a year and get support in a uh, safe environment. Um, and then the last two options are outpatient treatment programs. Comac Clinic has various treatment centers all around Maryland uh, where patients can receive IOP, outpatient and medication assisted treatment. And then lastly, Johns Hopkins Broadway Center for Addiction where is where I, I work as well. We provide um, intensive outpatient, outpatient and medication assisted treatment. And then more generally, a good resource on the next slide is that um, SAMHSA, which is a uh, substance abuse and mental health services administration through the um, National Institutes of Health and Human Services, has a helpline that you can call, um, a substance use treatment locator, findtreatment.gov. And all you have to do is go in and um, type in the, uh, your zip code or your address, and it'll come up with a whole list of different treatment program options, um, information about what kind of treatment options they offer, 
as well as the types of insurance they, they take and how to contact them for an intake. So I'm gonna end here and let Bishop Sewell tell his story and um, give you good. another perspective on, on recovery. Thank you so much, Dr. I, I was busy taking notes with you there. Um, <laughs> so well put together, very good. And hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Bishop William Sewell. Uh, I am uh, founder of the Interfaith Academy Church. It's a church that caters to those who suffer with the disease of addiction. Uh, church has been in existence now for uh, 21 years. Uh, I'm the founder and the pastor. Uh, we were birthed out of the I Can't Weekend Recovery Program, which dissolved some five years ago. But we continued in the spiritual uh, aspect as a church uh, catering to those who suffer from addiction. Interestingly enough, we're the only church in Maryland, and I was told several places, but I know in Maryland that had that is a recovery church, not a church with a recovery program. Uh, this program, I Can't Weekend, was founded by um, Mr. Israel Kason, who just passed recently, uh, I think uh, in uh, July, I want to say, maybe somewhere. No, I'm sorry, in uh, March. But he was the founder, um, and the program uh, lasted a, a good 11 years. Uh, and... Um, we were, I'm sorry, about 14 years, and uh, we were well on the map in Maryland. We had a membership at one time, and I say membership rather than any other word, because people came because they wanted to, not because they were forced. So it was members, membership, if I can use that word, and we had a, a, a hundred, at one time, 137 people. Uh, and ran for good a good nine or 10 years with 80 to 110 people all the time at one time, a full year program based on uh, uh, recovery and spirituality. I am a Vietnam veteran, came home from Vietnam in uh, 1969, uh, was introduced to drugs in Vietnam. Um, uh, knew about marijuana when I left, but by the time I left Vietnam, I was hash and cocaine, heroin, uh, speed, black beauties, whatever, you name it, it was there. Uh, I was uh, attracted to cocaine and I liked the way that worked for me. And uh, that was my drug of choice from 1969 to 1984. Uh, I snorted cocaine and uh, often use the terminology as we do in meetings sometime that um, in my nose, I lost a house, I lost two cars and a family, a wife and a daughter. All of that was lost right up my nostrils. And with that, it would be amazing to know that during that time, I'd lost a brother. My youngest brother was shot and killed, shot in the head in a drug deal, whom I loved very dearly. And then my older brother, who I admired and was kind of like my hero, he od from drugs. I was moved by those and things. And in uh, 1984, after 15 years of addiction, I uh, went through the spiritual process and I asked God to please help me to get me away from this. And uh, it happened like that, without the dramatics and all, but it happened like that. I was in church on New Year's Eve night in 1979 and I uh, was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I just asked God to take it away. And he did. And I just couldn't believe after all of that, that I was approached to start a church for a recovery program. I was like, you want me to start a church after what happened to my brothers and me? But uh, I'm a firm believer that God knows, I'm a positive believer that God knows well better than me. And so it, it worked out. Um, I went through many of the things that um, Dr. Haas was talking about and I'm, I'm just so fascinated 
uh, in all ways, I've been to some classes similar, but that was just a great presentation to see how much it is a disease, if I might say that, because that's what we taught that drugs is a, it's a disease. We had a statement that drugs were a self-defeating, self-destructive way of thinking. And what we based it on that the polar opposite to that was spirituality. As the people came in, the program I Can Weekend had a imam from the Muslim community. They had a rabbi organ from the Jewish community and I founded the Protestant church or the Christian community, if you will. And um, in this program, it was required that you attended uh, at least three hours of spiritual service a week, which was generally church on a Sunday and Bible study or uh, Juma for the, uh, for the Muslims and then uh, going to the synagogue uh, or Rabbi Or can come in to talk to the Jewish community. Um, the abuse, uh, as we see it, and, and we taught, you know, we, um, uh, we did several classes, seminars, and everything. We just didn't jump out and do it. We studied from a book called Learning to Live Again, because we find that, you know, in the presentation, literally, this person is dead to everything but a drug, living on someone else's terms and not life terms. And uh, someone else's terms with the one who could present you with the drugs that would help you to believe that you were really living, but yet you were dead, if the truth be told. Uh, in my addiction, I really um, found at times, and as Dr. Hans was telling us, I found comfort and enjoying my food, enjoying this or that, but only after I got high. I had to get high first, and then I would appreciate it more, I thought. Um, so often, just that idea, when our clients came in, and 9,000 people came through our program over that time. When they came in, they would come, and within 30 to 90 days, uh, as they were, uh, detoxing and getting clean, it was found that they had all kinds of problems, diabetes, heart trouble, kidney infections, and not uh, really able to be bugged by it because the drugs had altered the mind so that the only thing that mattered was the drug. And so many of them came in AIDS and everything. I mean, just not knowing living on the drugs, and that that is surely a disease. And that's why I love that presentation. Uh, drugs, though we have a substance use disorder, that is a disease because I'm not stepping on what you know, Doc, but I, I, I know that's mental, it's a mental illness. So we tried to deal and address that in the program. We had a 24 hour, a care, as you talked about, with 365 days at the time of um, the completion, they had a graduation, the family came, they were given a certificate, and more often than not, we had job placement for them somewhere, wherever it was, if it was dominoes, it didn't matter, we had job placement just to get them started, because that uh, recovery turns into once a person has fully recovered into responsibility, and sometimes you can find your best out of those people uh, that were like that. I myself, 15 years of addiction, uh, went back to school for 11 years. You know, my uh, bachelor's degree, master's, and a, a doctor's degree in 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 uh, drug drug recovery and administration. Went to St. Mary Seminary, Lynchburg College in Virginia, and so. You, you know, you, you alter, you, you change, you get to the point now where uh, I like this responsibility rather than the dependability. 
I depended on drugs. It was everything I did. And so when you come out of dependability into responsibility, it, it, keeping it in, in moderation, though, you really, really, really become serious about what you're doing, and it's a great feed. So we often uh, study the fact of the in this living to learn again. Again, the doctor covered this, but it's from you know the I, I guess just the side of uh, the, the 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 attic inside as he talks about the medical. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so we're speaking of the physical process as we go through what he showed us through the medical process. And one thing we knew that he kind of realized that, that it, it, it's an environmental thing. Um, I used to think it was cool. Um, my, my brothers and them would uh, smoke some marijuana or they would drink and they would go out and they said they had a good time and they would come in, you'd hear them laughing, they were loud and you thought, wow. Them guys having a good time. So a lot of the drug addiction it, it, it is and the substance use disorder is absolutely environmental and inherent. It's inherited. You, know, you can you can pick those uh, and and I've noticed in the presentation that you can get those things from you know your parents and alcoholism and drug use are being inherited through the blood system or whatever or just the behavioral uh, uh, um, ways of a person through the genes. Uh, we 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 experience that and and it, and it becomes cool and it becomes attractive. Everybody has fun, and I, I I notice now more than ever that when someone has a, a used to have a party, uh, it would in the beginning just go real slow and music would play, but as soon as the bottles of liquor hit the table and people start drinking. All of a sudden, they had a good time. And I, I was like, wow, if they didn't drink, would they have had a good time? Would they appreciate the love of being with family, the love of good health, or the love of having this social time together? And not, and, and a lot of us who maybe don't have a total addiction, but we use that as a tool to say we had a good time. When we take a drink, or I said take a hit of cocaine, and if I got, if it's kind of kind of wore off of me, I'd go back and take a little hit to stay in a jovial mood. And it wasn't really a jovial mood. It's just my mind was altered to anything that wasn't, if the truth be told, it wasn't sensible. It had to be something that was pseudo. It was a false joy. It was a false party. Because often you would come home and the next morning the question would be, man, you had a good time last night. And your question would be, what did I do? How in the world you have a good time and not know what you're doing? <laughs> it's just crazy. But those are, you know, the things that that I, I I've dealt with, and then I was able to teach, preach, pray, and help people with. Um, uh, in my tenure uh, as uh, the founder of the church and the spiritual mentor, um, we we had so many people who uh, changed their lives, were baptized. So many of them out there working now. My church right now, I have five ministers, all who are at least 12 to 15 years clean. My chairman of my deacon board, chairman of my trustee board are addicts who were out there for a long time, and every one of them were locked up. I had a few night stints in jail myself, um, but they are, um, they are all leaders in the church. They're all um, responsible for the operation of the church. The church is running on a pretty heavy budget. We have a $1,600 a month mortgage and uh, we manage well. Uh, and it's operated by uh, the, uh, the body uh, with some new members now because another church joined us, but the root of the body of the church are four ministers for, for uh, five deacons, myself, and, um, and, and, and another bishop that was he that's here. All of us were addicts. And I'm, I'm 30, let me see, 19, yeah, I'm 30, uh, 34 years clean. And uh, this is just the result of programs such as substance use disorder. It, it's, it, it's something that we have to address, we have to approach, and we can't give up because sometimes it seems like it's no hope. But not to be cliche-ish, but to, to really say it really, if I just help one person, then that's good because that one person can go help somebody else. I don't have to see it. I don't have to be a part of it. I don't need stats 
I just need the results to know that somebody else will come off of the uh, substance use disorder and become a, 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 a full successful person in society, person in society. Uh, uh, persons, one thing I found also that in, in, in the idea of recovery is that we must approach people and make sure that they want it. When they came to I Can't We Can Ask Why You're Here. Now, this may sound cruel, but it's very real. Well, my wife, man, she just told me she's not going to put up with it no more. My mother told me I'm going to have to get out. And we would not accept that excuse. You have to want it yourself. If you want to recover, you're not going to recover for your kids. You're not going to do it. You're not going to recover for mommy. You're not going to recover for girlfriend. Or you're not going to recover to get this job. Once you get it, you're not recovered. You're just holding off until you get what you need so that you can go back to what you love. And, and speaking of love, uh, 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 drugs becomes the love of your life. Uh, I was telling Dr. House earlier, and, I, and we were talking, uh, when you know you meet your first girlfriend or your first boyfriend or whatever your selection is, when your parents say that I don't like that person, that person's not for you, you become offended and you become defensive because you love that person. And you may not know exactly what love is, but right now it's everything I need and everything I want and I don't care what nobody says. And that's how drugs can take over your mind. That's how I can take you fall in love with it. I know I went to bed at night and I had to be sure that when I went to bed at night that I had enough drug and cigarettes that when I woke up in the morning, I would not be out of them, causing me to lie to my friends and have a, 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 a dime bag of cocaine in my sock and ask somebody uh, help me out so we can get a hit before I go in. And, and I would already have a dime bag, but then I'd say I got 250 and they would put the rest up. And then I would often say, I don't have no cigarettes. And I had a pack in my sock, but it was just to get up in the morning because I wanted to lay down with my drug and I wanted to be there when I got up. And that is, that's sickness. That's really sickness. Mm -hmm. But that's what it does. It becomes your first love. Mm -hmm. So. I'm on a I'm on a Bluetooth. If it cuts off, I think I'll just come back in on speaker. Are you all hearing me? Yes, we hear you, Bishop. Okay, okay. And thank you so so much for sharing. You know everything that you've been through from I mean being in Vietnam. I thank you for your service and and just everything that you've done to to really help the community out in Baltimore. I mean, I'm sort of speechless. You said a few things about. Um, just the responsibility over dependency. And I have some friends who personally are struggling with substance use disorders. And I just really hope for them that they get to that point of like, you know, choosing something that they're passionate about mm. and like love over, over what's kind of holding them back. And it's, it's really hard. Um, and Dr. Shu, thank you so much for sharing the, you know, the like research side of everything. I have some questions. Um, we are, we have about 10 minutes left um, before the support group is totally going to be boot us off. So <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody has a question, please feel free to type it into the question and answer. Um, and I was actually um, typing in answers. I don't know if I was supposed to do that or if you were going to read them off. Um, let's yeah. see. Folks, if, since we're being mindful of time, if you want to look at the answers that Dr. Shu has written inside of the um, inside the Q and A, you just hover over to the Q and A section and look at the answers. Um, you can feel free to do that. Why don't we take the open questions right now? Um, let's see. I think this one is kind of um, first. Caroline says. Congratulations, Bishop Sewell. Is there any way to attend your church online? What's the name of it again? Yes, the name of my church is Interfaith, I-N-T-E-R-F-A-I-T-H, Interfaith Love Crowd Church. We are a crowd of people in love with each other. So we're Love Crowd Church, Interfaith Love Crowd Church uh, that developed from the addiction. Uh, you can get us on that Interfaith uh, Academy, because that was the original name, Interfaith Academy, you can pick us up on Facebook on Sunday mornings uh, at 10 at, uh, at 1130. Mm -hmm. uh, our services start at 1130. We're located in Baltimore at 4155 Hayward Avenue, 21215. But if you go on Facebook, we live stream every Sunday 
And also on tonight, you can come on at uh, seven o'clock for our Bible study. Yep. Uh, we are uh, again on that same one. And you would, you, even though it's Interfaith Love Crowd Church, our, our link for the uh, Facebook is Interfaith Church, Interfaith Academy Church. Awesome. That's that's mm -hmm. wonderful. I was able to catch a little bit actually when I was looking you up and saw your um, Facebook recordings. They're they're very powerful. Oh, okay. um, so we have another question here. What about the use of Effexor when a patient has a co-occurring disorder? Um, and maybe Dr. Shu, if you can like talk about just co-occurring disorders in general and like the intersection between like a mental health condition and yeah. substance use and like self-education and that stuff that would be cool i think there was another question from carolyn harrison about how to handle somebody who's been still relapsing and diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and what i said is that it's important to address both disorders because they can both feed into each other so someone who continually continually uses substances can be unstable with their mental health disorders because substances can cause a person to be more depressed and anxious and also they're less likely to take their um, psychotropic medications. And on the other side, somebody who has an untreated uh, depressive or anxiety disorder may be more likely to relapse to substances because of their um, emotional instability. Um, so simultaneous treatment with a psychiatrist and a um, somebody who's experienced in uh, addiction treatment is very important and to address both. I know when I first started in this field in the 90s, it was either one or the other. So psychiatrists would either say, um, oh, their depression or anxiety is just due to their heroin use. So we're not gonna start them on any psychotropic medications. They need to get clean first before we start treating them. Or um, on the flip side, uh, somebody who presents a substance use disorder treatment will say that they can't get treatment because their mental health conditions are too severe. But we know now that the gold standard and the best way to treat somebody who has co-occurring disorders is to address both disorders at once. And then for the specific question about the use of Effexor, um, um, so that's, I can't answer specifically because I don't know what type of co-occurring disorder the person has, but Effexor is a good medication and I've used it with patients that I've treated who have alcohol or opioid disorder and have a major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so that would be a reasonable choice for somebody who either has a depression, a depressive or anxiety disorder as long, uh, along with a substance use disorder. Awesome. All right. And somebody else typed in here. Great presentation from both the bishop and doctor. I have one um, question. Oh, thank you, Ken. Um, Ken says, Thank you so much for sharing so much valuable information in your personal, powerful stories. Um, I have Thanks. one question for you because I've sort of heard a recurring theme and maybe we can kind of close out on this unless we get another question. But um, I just from your presentation, Dr. Shu, and what you were sharing, Bishop Sewell, about you know, the importance of community and just people and leaning on one another and kind of finding a purpose in that um, with you know, home or family, um, and understanding that like addiction recovery is something that the individual who is currently experiencing the addiction has to decide that they want to make the choice to recover yeah. to start mm -hmm. anything. What are some ways that, you know, the community at large can be a little bit more mindful of people, you know, who are struggling with addiction, or maybe, you know, they, they're worried about them and want them to get help, but also know that it's a journey and it's like a chronic condition relapse uh -huh. is potentially inevitable what what would you want them to know or like what what takeaways are there yeah so i i would just start out by saying that a person may not be ready for treatment at the time that you approach them but mm -hmm. you should be open and willing and be a resource for that person um to be available to, to engage when they are ready to seek help, help and to keep the keep the door open and not yeah. just dismiss somebody just because they're not willing to seek help at that time. And also to avoid things that are kind of stigmatizing, like calling somebody an addict or a drug abuser instead of saying so, uh, that uh, your friend or your loved one is a person with a substance use disorder. Because the important thing is not to label somebody, but to realize that, that they're humans and that um, I think there was one question that that said that uh, drug use 
uh, that she, she always thought drug use was a personal choice. Well, it may be a personal choice to decide to start using substances, but I don't think anybody chooses to become addicted. And no. fortunately, that happens to <laughs> that happens to some of us. Right. And um, you know, and for more substance for for uh, more so for some substances than others. So if you think like about alcohol, all of us have had most of us have had alcohol at some point in our life, but we don't become addicted to it. Um, so as I said before, being exposed to drugs and alcohol at an early age, which causes brain changes, and then having a family history of alcohol use disorder can also contribute to somebody um, developing alcohol use disorder later in life. Absolutely. What about you, Bishop Sewell? Well, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with Dr. Dr. Shu. I'm sorry, because I said your name wrong around nine or 10 times. But oh, that's fine. <laughs> Charge it to my mind and not my heart, please. I heard everything you said. It was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Shu. But also, uh, one thing that be careful of, and you brought it up, Dr. Shu, and everybody should know, being loving doesn't, uh, uh, is not synonymous with enabling. You love that person, you can show them love, and yet don't enable them. Many people think that they love the person. I've been told, well, I just had to give him something. I couldn't watch him go through that this morning. And 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 uh, the, the terminology on the street, Doc, I know you heard it. They, they wanted to get out the gate. In other words, they needed to get out the gate. And they couldn't do nothing until they had a, a drink or a hit. And people would give it to them. And they think that they're doing it because they don't want to seem like, but that's not in love. Love is not synonymous with en enabling. You cannot enable a person and say you love them. You become not part of the solution, but you become the problem as much as they do. And then they will know right away because of the, the, the dopamine make them say right away, look, go back there. They'll act, just act sad, act, act like you're hurting real bad. And they begin to use you and, 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 and they use you to abuse themselves. And it makes a terrible bit of enabling when you have, let somebody use you to abuse themselves. I don't want that on me. I don't want that charge. I don't want that, uh, that, that indictment on me. So to, 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 I want everybody to know that loving someone simply is not synonymous with enabling them. And I hope you really get that. That's the important piece. Because once it's over, more often than not, you'll hear people say, I thank God or I thank God my mother didn't give me that drink when I needed it or that hit when I needed it because that's what got me into the program. That's what got me really aware of my substance use disorder when my mother turned me down or my wife turned me down on my children. And so it's very important that we just keep in mind that, you know, uh, uh, um, enabling is not synonymous with loving. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Sewell and Dr. Shu. I appreciate you. I'm just mindful of the time, yeah. and I'm sorry we yeah. <laughs> had a couple technical hiccups. But oh, one sorry. last thing to bring up: uh, Would the participants get a copy of my slides just so they have the information on how to find resources? Yes. Would wow. you Would you like the, to share them? Yes. Super. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Then yes. As long as you're okay with that, then we will have okay. to share them um, to even folks who weren't able to join. We'll share a recording with everybody. And thank you all for being here and for bearing with us. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out when I send that email. And if you want to get connected to either Bishop Sewell or Dr. Shu, I'm sure they'd be happy to be resources. So I just voluntold you both. And I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Nova, Nova if I just could real quick. Just yeah. want to thank you for moderating this meeting and your concern and your 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 your, your wonderful personality and uh, your service to this program and helping people. So we just want to thank you too. Oh, I share the same sentiments. Thank you, Nova. Thank you, guys. Well, I hope this is one of many. So <laughs> yeah. stay tuned, you all, and take care. Thank you for your work. Good night, everybody. God bless you. God bless you all, and good night. Good, good night. night. Have a good evening.